The Abominable Nature of Sin by Dr. John Owen is actually taken from chapter 18 of his work on a dissertation on divine justice, the uses of the doctrine. Let us at length put an end to this dispute, and as all acknowledging of the truth ought to be after godliness, we shall deduce such useful and practical evident conclusions as flow from this truth, which we have thus set forth and defended, that we may not be thought to have spent our labor in vain. First, then, hence, we sinners may learn the abominable nature of sin. Whatever there is in heaven or in earth that we have seen or of which we have heard, whatever declares the glory of the Creator, also exposes this disgraceful fall of the creature, the genuine offspring of sin or death and hell. For sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, that the heavens cast out their native inhabitants, namely, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, and so on, that the earth is filled with darkness, resentments, grease, malediction, and revenge, is to be attributed entirely to this cankerous ulcer of nature. Hence the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The earth, lately founded by a most beneficent creator, is cursed. Hence the old world, having but just emerged from the deluge, the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved to fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Yea, for as much as in the state of things which we have described as being permitted by the will of God, the creature was made subject to vanity. There is none of the creatures which by its confusion, vanity, and quietude does not declare this detestable poison with which it is thoroughly infected to be exceeding sinful. This is the source and origin of all evils to sinners themselves. Whatever darkness, tumult, vanity, slavery, fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation to consume the adversaries, oppresses, tortures, harasses, vexes, burns, corrupts, or kills. Whatever from without, penal, grievous, sad, dire, dreadful, even the last unavoidable calamity itself is all to be attributed to this prolific parent of miseries. Someone perhaps will wonder what this so great a plague is which perverts the course of the creation what crime, what kind of inexpiable wickedness that has produced a creature so very highly exalted and created in the image of God to share in his glory after being banished from heaven and paradise, an eternal deprivation of his glory, punishment to which no measure or end is appointed, what has so incensed the mind of the most bountiful and merciful Father of all, and embittered his anger, that he should bring eternal sorrows on the work of his own hands, and kindle a fire that should burn to the lowest bottom, and inflame the foundations of the mountains, I will tell him in one word. Is it to be wondered at that God should be disposed severely to punish that which earnestly wishes him not to be God, and strive to accomplish this with all its might? Sin opposes the divine nature in existence. It is enmity against God, and it is not an idle enemy. It is even engaged in a mortal war with all the attributes of God. He would not be God if he did not avenge, by the punishment of the guilty, his own injury. He has often and heavily complained in his word that by sin he is robbed of his glory and honor, affronted, exposed to calumny and blasphemy, that neither his holiness nor his justice nor name nor right nor dominion is preserved pure and untainted, for he has created all things for his own glory, and it belongs to the natural right of God to preserve that glory entire by the subjection of all his creatures and their proper stations to himself. And shall we not reckon that sin is entirely destructive of that order, which would entirely wrest that right out of his hands, and a thing to be restrained by the severest punishments? Let sinners then be informed that every the least transgression abounds so much with hatred against God is so highly injurious to him, and as far as is in its power brands him with such folly, impotence, and injustice, so directly robs him of all his honor, glory, and power, that if he wills to be God, he can by no means suffer it to escape unpunished. 
It was not for nothing that on that day on which he made man a living soul, he threatened him with death, even eternal death, that in giving his law he thundered forth so many dread execrations against this fatal evil, that he has threatened it with such punishment, with so great anger, with fury, wrath, tribulation, and anguish, that with a view to vindicate his own glory and provide for the salvation of sinners, he made his most holy son, who was holy, harmless, and undefiled, and separate from sinners, sin and a curse, and subjected him to that last punishment, the death of the cross, including in it the satisfaction due to his violated law. All these things divine justice required as necessary to the preservation of his honor, glory, wisdom, and dominion. Let every proud complaint of sinners then be hushed, for we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that do evil. But sin, in respect of the creature, is folly, madness, fury, blindness, hardness, darkness, stupor, giddiness, torpor, turpitude, uncleanness, nastiness, a stain, a spot, an apostasy, degeneracy, a wandering from the mark, a turning aside from the right path, a disease, a languor, destruction, death. In respect of the Creator, it is a disgrace, an affront, blasphemy, enmity, hatred, contempt, rebellion, an injury. In respect of its own nature, it is poison, a stench, dung, a vomit, polluted blood, a plague, a pestilence, an abominable, detestable, cursed thing, which by its most pernicious power of metamorphosing has transformed angels into devils, light into darkness, life into death, paradise into a desert, a pleasant, fruitful, blessed world into a vain, dark, accursed prison, and a lord of all into a servant of servants, which has rendered man the glory of God an enemy to himself, a wolf to others, hateful to God, his own destroyer, the destruction of others, the plague of the world, a monster, and a ruin, attempting to violate the eternal, natural, and indispensable right of God, to cut the thread of the creature's dependence on the Creator, it introduced with it this world of iniquity. First, then, to address you who live, or rather are dead, under the guilt, dominion, power, and law of sin, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? The judgment of God is that they who commit those things to which you are totally given up, and which you cannot refrain from, are worthy of death. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, since it is a just thing with him to render to everyone according to his works. And who shall deliver you out of his mighty hand? Wherewith can the wrath to come be averted? Wherewithal can you make atonement to so great a judge? Sacrifices avail nothing. Hence those words in the prophet which express not so much the language of inquiry as of confusion and astonishment. Wherewithal shall I come to appear before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Would you attempt an obedience arduous and expensive beyond all credibility? By such dreadful propitiations, by such dire and accursed sacrifices, at the thought of which human nature shudders, would you appease the offended deity? You are not the first whom a vain superstition and ignorance of the justice of God is forced to turn away their ear from the sighs and cries of tender infants, breathing out their very vitals, your own blood, in vain. These furies, which now by starts agitate us within, will by their vain attempts against the snares of death torment us to all eternity, for God, the judge of all, will not accept of sacrifice or offering or burnt offerings for sin, 
With these he is not at all delighted, for the redemption of the soul is precious and ceases forever. God cannot so lightly esteem or disregard his holiness, justice, and glory, to which your sins have done so great an injury, that he should renounce them all for the sake of hostile conspirators, unless there should be some other remedy quickly provided for us, unless a judge himself shall provide a lamb for a burnt offering, unless the gates of a city of refuge shall be quickly opened to you, exclaiming and trembling at the avenging curse of the law, unless you can find access to the horns of the altar. If God be to remain blessed forever, you must doubtless perish forever. If then you have the least concern or anxiety for your eternal state, hasten while it is called today, to lay hold on the hope that is set before you. Give yourselves up entirely to him. Receive him, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, that he might declare his righteousness. But what and how bitter a sense of sin! How deep a humiliation, contrition, and dejection of heart and spirit! What self-hatred, condemnation, and contempt! What great self-indignation and revenge! What esteem, what faith and the necessity, excellence, and dignity of the righteousness and satisfaction of Christ, especially if God has graciously condescended to bestow his Holy Spirit, to convince men's hearts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, without whose effectual aid and heart-changing grace, even the most opposite remedies applied to this disease will be in vain. And to excite and work such sentiments concerning the transgression of the divine law, the nature of sin, or the disobedience of the creatures, a persuasion how fit and proper those who have spiritual eyes will easily perceive. To those happy persons whose sins are forgiven, and to whom God will not impute iniquity, because he has laid their transgressions upon Christ. The knowledge of this divine truth is as a spur to quicken them to the practice of every virtue and to sincere obedience. For in what high, yea, infinite honor and esteem must God be held by him who, having escaped from the snares of death and the destruction due to him, through his inexpressible mercy, has thoroughly weighed the nature of sin and the consequences of it, which we have mentioned before. For whosoever shall reflect with himself that such is the quality and nature of sin, that it is so impiously inimical to God, that unless by some means his justice be satisfied by the punishment of another, he could not pardon it or let it pass unpunished, will ever acknowledge himself indebted to eternal love, for the remission of the least transgression, because in inexpressible grace and goodness it has been forgiven. And hence, too, we may learn how much beyond all other objects of our affection we are bound to love with our heart and soul, and all that is within us, our dear and beloved Deliverer, and most merciful Savior Jesus Christ, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. What Tigranus, the son of the king of Armenia, had said to Cyrus, that he would purchase his wife's liberty at the price of his life, and she was consequently set free by Cyrus, while some were admiring and extolling one virtuous Cyrus, and some another, she being asked what she most admired, and that illustrious hero answered, My thoughts were not turned upon him. Her husband again asking her, Upon whom then? She replied, Upon him who said that he would redeem me from slavery at the expense of his life. Is not he then to be caressed and dearly beloved, to be contemplated with faith, love, and joy, who answered for our lives with his own, devoted himself to punishment and at the price of his blood, while we were yet enemies, purchased us and rendered us a peculiar people to himself, we now secure may contemplate in his agony, sweat, tremor, horror, exclamations, prayers, cross, and blood. What is God's severity against sin? What the punishment of the broken law and curse are? Unless God, the judge and ruler of all, after having thoroughly examined the nature, hearts, breasts, ways, and lives of us all, had thence collected whatever was contrary to his law, improper, unjust, and impure, Whatever displeased the eyes of his purity, provoked his justice, roused his anger and severity, and laid it all on the shoulders of our Redeemer, and condemned it in his flesh, 
It had been better for us, rather than to be left eternally entangled in the snares of death and of the curse, never to have enjoyed the common air, but to have been annihilated as soon as born. Wretched men that we are, who shall deliver us from this most miserable state by nature? Thanks be to God, which gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. May we always then be sick of love towards our Deliverer. May he always be our beloved who is white and ruddy and the chiefest among ten thousand. The acknowledging of this truth has a respect not only to the manifestation of his justice, but also of the wisdom, holiness, and dominion of God over his creatures. For that justice which, in respect of its effect and egress, we call vindicatory, which, as we have before demonstrated, is natural to God and essential, and therefore absolutely perfect in itself, or rather perfection itself, this very truth, which we have thus far defended, evidently illustrates, is also his supreme rectitude in the exercise of it, when he sits on a throne judging righteously, and how severe a judge he will be towards impenitent sinners, whose sins are not expiated in the blood of Christ. That justice is not a free act of the divine will, which God may use or renounce at pleasure, nor a sin only a debt of ours, which, as we were unable to pay, he might forgive by only freely receding from his right. For what reason, then, could be assigned why the Father of mercy should so severely punish his most holy Son on our account, that he might, according to justice, deliver us from our sins, when without any difficulty, by one act of his will, and that to a most free and holy act, he could have delivered both himself and us, wretched sinners, from this evil. But it exists in God in the manner of a habit, natural to the divine essence itself, perpetually and immutably inherent in it, which from his very nature he must necessarily exercise in every work that respects the proper object of his justice. For sin is that ineffable evil which would overturn God's whole right over his creatures unless it were punished. As then the perfection of divine justice is infinite, and such as God cannot by any means relax, it is of the last importance to sinners seriously and deeply to bethink themselves how they are to stand before him. Also the infinite wisdom of God, the traces of which we so clearly read in creation, legislation, and in other works of God, is hereby wondrously displayed to the eternal astonishment of men and angels, for none but an infinitely wise God could bring it about, that that which is in its own nature opposite to him, inimical and full of obstinacy, should turn out to his highest honor and the eternal glory of his grace. Yea, the divine wisdom not only had respect to God himself, and to the security of his glory, honor, right, and justice, but even provided for the good of miserable sinners, for their best interests, exaltation, and salvation, and from the empoisoned bowels of sin itself. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness, by interposing a surety and covenant head between sin and the sinner. Between the transgression of the law and its transgressor, he condemned and punished sin, restored the law, and freed the sinner both from sin and from the law. He has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Ephesians 1.8 When he made all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. Chapter 3, verse 9 For in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 2 and 3 it will be forever esteemed a miracle of God's providence that he should have made the captivity or wicked cell of Joseph by means of so many windings, perplexed mazes, and strange occurrences issue at last in his own exaltation and the preservation of his brethren who impiously sold him. But if any one, though endowed with the tongues of angels and of men, should attempt to describe this mystery of divine wisdom, in which it is evident that God exalts his own name, and not only recovers his former honor, but even raises it, manifests his justice, preserves inviolable his right and dominion in pardoning sin, in which he is highly pleased and incredibly delighted, and unless this heavenly discovery, a truly godlike invention, had intervened, he could not have pardoned even the least sin. He must feel his language not only deficient, but the eye of the mind overpowered with light will fill him with awe and astonishment, that that which is the greatest, yea, the only disgrace and affront to God, should turn out to his highest honor and glory, 
that that which could not be permitted to triumph without the greatest injury to the justice, right, holiness, and truth of God should find grace and pardon to the eternal and glorious display of justice, right, holiness, and truth was a work that required infinite wisdom, an arduous task, in every way worthy of God. Finally, let us constantly contemplate in the mirror of this truth the holiness of God, in which he is of purer eyes than to behold evil, in whose presence the wicked shall not stand, that we ourselves may become more pure in heart and more holy in life, speech, and behavior. End quote, chapter 18. A Dissertation on Divine Justice by John Owen